All right, time for the eyeball. Okay, so this is one of the models of the eyeball. We're going to start with the muscles of the eye. We have extrinsic eye muscles. Extrinsic eye muscles just means the muscles that are on the outside of the eye. Your extrinsic eye muscles are going to be able to move your eye around so that you can look in different directions. We have four muscles that are rectus muscles. Rectus, remember, means straight. So the one that we have on the top here, so this one on top here, this is the superior rectus, the superior rectus. When this muscle shortens, the eye is gonna be able to gaze upwards. This is the nasal bone here. Okay, so this is medial, this is lateral. So this rectus muscle, this is the lateral rectus muscle of the eye. Here is the medial rectus of the eye. Okay. And then if you kind of look underneath, there's also the inferior rectus muscle as well. Now, we have two other muscles. So we have, for the rectus muscles, we have the superior, inferior, medial, and lateral rectus muscles of the eye. Now we have two additional muscles of the eye <clears throat> that are not situated straight. So they're not rectus muscles. Instead, they're situated kind of diagonally. You might remember that diagonally is oblique, okay? So we have two oblique muscles. One is here, which you can just kind of see here. This is the inferior oblique, the inferior oblique. And on the top, this muscle here, this is also a muscle. This is the superior oblique, the superior oblique. Okay, so we have the superior and inferior oblique muscles. What those do is they're going to rotate the eye. Okay, now that might sound weird. It's like my eyeball's not doing this. Well, the reason that it's not doing this is because of the tension that the uh, superior and inferior um, oblique muscles do so as as my rectus muscles are making the eye move up and down right and left my superior and inferior obliques are adjusting their tension levels to keep the eye from doing this sort of thing their their plane of force is in the rotational motion so if you were able to stimulate those without stimulating the rectus muscles then your eye would be wobbling <laughs> Okay, so, but they're keeping your eyes steady. So those are the extrinsic eye muscles. And the last thing I'll show you on this one before we go on to the other models is this has this nice big long optic nerve. Okay, so this is the optic nerve. So next we will do this eye model. Okay, and we'll start again with the extrinsic eye models and then we will start getting into these deeper structures. So the rectus muscles here, I've got the superior superior rectus on these models. So how are you going to know what is medial versus lateral? So when you find the superior oblique, okay, this is the superior oblique muscle. The superior oblique muscle, if you remember from this model, it goes medially, okay? So this is the superior oblique, this white thing right here. And this model, in order to orient yourself, you wanna find the superior oblique and know that the superior oblique is going to point to the medial side, which will then make this the medial rectus muscle. So superior oblique, superior rectus, medial rectus. Here on the bottom, this is the inferior rectus, inferior rectus. So on the lateral side, we have our lateral rectus and the inferior oblique on this model is located here. This is the inferior oblique. The white portion of your eye, all of this here, the white portion of your eye actually encompasses almost all of the eye globe. So if I were to poke out your eyeball, um, you would see probably something similar to this. And um, you would see a lot of the white portion here, this whole white portion, and it extends very far back. Okay, so even back here, this is all sclera, sclera. Okay, so the white portion of your eye is the sclera. This is on the outer portion. Now, if I were to go up to your eyeball with this probe, I wouldn't do this as long as you're getting an A in my class, right? <clears throat> so anyways, 
<laughs> no pressure. Um, so, but if I were to go and start poking your eyeball, the first thing, first thing that I would be poking at here is this clear cover. Okay, this clear cover is the cornea of the eye. The cornea of the eye. The first thing that, that light will need to go through in order to enter the eye so that we can see is going to be the cornea. And the cornea is also what they shape if you're getting LASIK surgery. They can change the shape of this. So the clear covering here is the cornea. This is also cornea. Now when I turn this to the side, you'll notice it makes a chamber here. So it's this clear covering here. This is the cornea. And there's some space that exists. It's a little tiny chamber here. This is filled with fluid. The fluid that is behind the cornea is called the aqueous humor. The aqueous humor, because it is hilarious when you see it swim. So it's the aqueous humor. Wow, my joke's just getting worse by the second. <sighs> Even I don't laugh at my jokes anymore. That's how bad it is. Okay, so the aqueous humor is the fluid just behind the cornea in that little chamber. Okay, so, now when I take this apart, so light coming into the eye is first going to go through the cornea and then it will go through the aqueous humor. The next structure that the light is going to go through is the pupil. Okay, now the pupil is not an actual structure that you can put in your hand, okay? The pupil is literally a hole that exists in the iris. It's just the opening of the iris. So the pupil's function is to allow light to enter the eye. It's just a hole. So when when you're looking at th through somebody's pupil or when the doctor is shining that little light in your eye using an ophthalmoscope, what's actually occurring is the doctor is looking through your eye and they're being able to see the retina located on the back of your eye. The What we call the colored portion of the eye here, this is the iris. The iris is going to function to change the size of the pupil. So this is, acts like a, an aperture and it's going to increase or decrease the size of this opening, which is the pupil. So light coming into the eye is going to pass through the pupil. So the outer portion of the eye, remember, is the sclera, the sclera. Now, if I were to take off the sclera, see all this brown stuff here, uh, this brown stuff is called the choroid coat, the choroid coat. Okay, so the outermost layer of the eye is the sclera. Lying deep to the sclera, because remember I took the sclera off, right? So underneath the sclera, we get the choroid coat. The choroid coat has the vasculature. So this is the blood supply. It's going to be bringing in nutrients, oxygen. It's also going to be taking away carbon dioxide, toxins, and that sort of thing. All right. So the choroid coat. So this is the front part of the eye. This is the back part of the eye. We will come back to those structures in just a minute. So light coming into the eye is going to go through the cornea first. Okay. Then it is going to go through a little bit of liquid called the aqueous humor that sits in that uh, anterior chamber of the eye. Then light is going to go through the pupil, which is made by an opening in the iris. The next structure that light is going to pass through is the lens. So let me just give you, get you oriented here. All right, so here's the iris, here's the pupil, then we have the lens which is sitting right behind the pupil. Now you'll notice that this is a clear structure and it's biconvex. There we go, I'm just gonna shove it in your face, there we go. Okay, so it's biconvex. It looks like a flying saucer. Okay, the cornea is just convex versus biconvex. So this is biconvex because it's convex on both sides. What the lens does, so what the lens does is the lens is going to focus the light onto the retina. Now the cornea also assists with focusing, okay? It assists with focusing the light onto the retina. That is why the cornea has its shape. Um, it's also why when we change the shape, we can correct somebody's vision, depending on what type of vision problems they have. But the problem with the cornea is it's fixed, okay? It's one shape and that's it, unless you get surgery. It can't adjust for things that are near versus far. It's just, it is what it is. But it is shaped a certain way and does help with focusing. 
It is important. But the real powerhouse for our focusing ability comes from the lens. It is responsible for focusing your image onto the retina. But to be more specific, it does what we call accommodation. Accommodation means the ability to see something up close and then to be able to see it from afar because our eyes actually have to adjust that focus differently. Just like on a camera, you have to adjust the focus differently for something that is far away versus close. Since the lens does accommodation, this means it has to be able to change its shape depending on what it is you're focusing on, okay? Now, the way that the lens changes shape is through another structure called the ciliary body. Okay, so let me go ahead and place this in here so that you can get an appreciation. So here is, here's your lens. And th the structures that I'm looking at here are on the opposite side of where you have your iris. Looking inside here, so the way that this changes shape is through muscles. And the muscles that we have here in the eye are the ciliary muscles. Okay. So this whole thing here is the ciliary body. The ciliary body includes the dark stuff here, which is the ciliary muscles. The ciliary muscles are going to attach to the lens through ciliary ligaments. So, um, yeah. So these muscles change the shape of the lens to accommodate for seeing things close versus far. So the layers of the eye, on the outer portion, we have the sclera, okay? Then I have this brownish stuff, all of this brown stuff, choroid coat. Choroid coat. So the choroid coat is in between the sclera and the innermost layer, which is the retina. So this whole thing is the retina. There's a couple of key uh, parts of the retina that I want you to know. This portion is the optic disc. The optic disc. The optic disc is the point at which the uh, optic nerve leaves the eye. So it is the point at which the optic nerve leaves the eye. This creates your blind spot because since this is where it is leaving the eye and this portion of the retina, you do not have any photoreceptors. If you really look at this model, you'll see that there is kind of a little ring here and then there's a tiny little yellow dot inside. So this larger circular thing is called the macula, the macula. You might have heard macular degeneration. This is the macula. Within the macula, there is a tiny portion within the macula called the fovea, fovea. We would also say it's called the fovea centralis. Okay, the fovea centralis. What the fovea centralis is, is the very centermost point of your vision. That area that looks so in focus in the center of your vision is falling on the fovea centralis in your retina. Okay, it has the highest concentration of photoreceptors. So the fovea centralis is part of the macula. It's just that center, center most point. All of the macula also has a very high uh, concentration of photoreceptors, but the highest will be the fovea centralis. And as you get further and further from the fovea centralis, you're going to get less and less concentration of photoreceptors. So remember the optic disc is the point at which the optic nerve leaves the eye. So when I flip this around, I see, oh, she didn't lie. That's good. Not this time anyways. So this is the optic nerve. Um, so on this model, it's labeled as number 15 back here. And they're saying that this is the optic disc. Okay. So, so this is the optic disc. Sorry. So, um, so this is the optic nerve, optic nerve. Okay. And this, this number right here is basically telling you that this is, uh, the point at which the optic nerve leaves the eye is the optic disc, but you can see it better visually here. Okay, so that is the eyeball.